Well, without further ado, I'd love to get started. I want to tell you a couple things that you may not be aware of um, in regards to U Health Jackson Children's Care. So, the pediatric emergency rooms at Holtz Children's Hospital, Jackson North, as well as Jackson West are available 24 7. They're always open and they're all staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. So, parents, and children, whoever comes in that ER, they're going to have access to every pediatric subspecialist, not only from Holtz Children's um, at UM system, but also the Jackson Health System. So really so much access to so many resources and experts. You're in great care there. Um, and also the Holtz Children's Hospital is a 24-hour kids only emergency room. So you know, emergency room is not really a place you ever want to be with a child, hopefully never, but if you have to be, Holtz is children's only, so that's a good thing to note, and all the doctors and nurses there are certified in pediatric advanced life support, so um, you're getting the best care, and this is something new I've been sharing at the last few weeks that we've been gathering, but the U Health Jackson Urgent Care Centers have partnered with UMNSU card, and they're achieving autism friendly designation, the first in Florida. So what does that mean? This means that um, the staff at Jackson at all five urgent care locations have been specifically trained and all the centers have a specifically designated sensory friendly exam room. So I know our OT who's listening in is like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, but these are are to serve families and give all patients the opportunity to experience healthcare in a safe and controlled environment. I think that is just awesome. So the first in Florida, bravo to you Health Jackson Children's Care for that. So, so thrilled. All right, so we have three experts tonight that you get to hear from. I wanna tell you a little bit about each one and then we're gonna get into your questions. So first off, if you'll just wave when I say your name so people know who you are, but the first one is Suzette Fernandez-Lewis. There's Suzette, <laughs> we're so glad you're here. She is a licensed pediatric speech and language pathologist, and she's at the Christine E. Lynn Rehabilitation Center for the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis at U Health Jackson Memorial. And she received her bachelor's from the University of South Florida and went on to do her master's at FIU. And for more than 10 years, she's gained professional experience in a variety of settings. So think public school, private school, private practice, home health, outpatient, inpatient, and acute care. So she's got a huge range of experience to offer us tonight. And her main clinical focus is evaluating, diagnosing, and treating children with a variety of communication and feeding disorders. So if that's something that maybe has affected your family, you're going to get to hear from Suzette tonight. And she's certified by the American Speech and Language and Hearing Association. So Suzette, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Okay. I got to introduce our other two guests and then we're ready to dive in. I'm, I'm so eager to get to the questions, but you've got to know who we're learning from. So our next guest is Stephanie Ragup, and she is a pediatric physical therapist. I'm going to say at the same location that yeah. Suzette is at, it's a very long name, but y'all are there together at the, um, the, the paralysis that you help. So, so glad that you're with us. She graduated with her bachelor's of science in kinesiology from the university of Maryland and went on to do her doctor of PT at FIU. So she has aquatic physical therapy competency, which sounds so cool. That sounds like, do you do physical therapy in the water? Cause that sounds exactly amazing. That. I love it. Especially in Miami. That's gotta be like such a, a great thing to be able to do. Love it. She also provides therapy in acute care, inpatient rehab and outpatient care settings. And she currently is working in the outpatient environment where she evaluates and treats children of all ages with a wide, a wide variety of diagnoses. So um, Stephanie, welcome, excited to learn from you in the PT realm. So we got, we got PT, we got speech and language. And then finally, Teresa Bertinelli is our, she's a primary outpatient OT. So she's an occupational therapist at the same location of these other two women. <laughs> and she graduated with a bachelor of arts in psychology went on to do her master's in OT at FIU. So I love that you ladies are all FIU grads too. That's awesome. She, um, she has provided family-centered care in acute care, inpatient rehab, and outpatient. And she has experience in assessing OT performance, um, developing individualized treatment plans, and also treating adult and pediatric patients who have orthopedic, neurological, developmental, 
and comprehensive conditions. So um, lots of exciting experts with us tonight. I'm so thrilled, Teresa, welcome. Thank you. Okay, we got to get going because we have so many questions. We're going to do our best to honor um, ending right here at nine o'clock. So if you have a question, again, drop it in our Q&A and I'll do our best to get it in front of our experts. But without further ado, let's talk about, Suzette, we're going to start with you. What is a speech and language pathologist and what do they do? So a speech language pathologist, we are trained to prevent, assess, diagnose, and treat a variety of communication and swallowing disorders. And some of those we do a lot. So speech sounds, so how well kids put together sounds. Um, we look at language, how we understand what we're hearing or we're reading, how we use words um, to tell others what we're really thinking. We work with literacy, how well we read and write social communication, how we follow um, rules, how we take turns, how we talk to different people. Do we stand too close to them or far? Um, we work with voice disorders. So how voices sound? Um, or is their voice hoarse? Are they talking too loud? Um, do they talk too much through their nose and are hypernasal? We do fluency, so stuttering, how speech flows. We work with cognitive communication, so um, problem solving, memory, attention. Um, we work with, and then feeding and swallowing. So how well um, kids are sucking from the bottle or breast or eating, are they picky eaters? Um, and then we do work in a variety of settings. So private practices, doctor's offices, hospitals, schools, um, in a variety of places. Love it. It's so easy to kind of, you hear the phrase speech and language, you know, pathologist, and you think if my child is a delayed speaker, or maybe if they have a stutter, I need to see a speech and language pathologist, but you just showed us there's so many other things that you do and that you cover. So we're excited to get more into that tonight. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Now, Teresa, tell us what's an occupational therapist and what do they do? So um, funny enough, I have a lot of people thinking occupational therapists help people find a job. Um, but we actually, we define um, occupations as meaningful activities. So um, if you know an occupational therapist, you probably heard the term activities of daily living or ADLs. So these are activities that you do every day, getting dressed, going to the bathroom, uh, putting on your shirt, uh, things of that sort. And in regards to kids, it's play. So our goal is to teach kids how to play appropriately, meaning um, how to manipulate different items, how to perform puzzles, depending on the milestone of each child, we try to get them to play appropriately for their age. Um, we help establish, restore a skill. And in the case that a child or a person may have a deficit that we can't really help them restore the skill, we show them modifications and we show them adaptive equipment to be able to be as independent as possible. That's awesome. I have to say, in college, I was one of those people and I thought, wow, that job sounds cool. They help people choose what job they want to have. <laughs> so yeah. a lot of misunderstanding there, job. but you know what? You're giving people so many skills that in the end, you know, it's probably going to help them find a great job one day. <laughs> so no wonderful things that you're doing in OT. And again, I am super excited to learn from all of you tonight because um, these topics are near and dear and are alive in our family right now. So I'm really excited. Um, okay, your turn, Steph, to tell us about what is a PT and what do they do? So PTs are healthcare providers that evaluate and treat people of all ages um, who have either injuries, disabilities, or health issues that are related to the musculoskeletal system, neurologic problems, cardiopulmonary system. Um, and we create patient specific treatment plans with the goal of improving basically movement and function and quality of life. Um, in regards to pediatrics, that tends to be um, the gross motor skills. So those are skills that require large muscle groups that help you sit and stand and walk and jump and keep your balance and change position. So that is what we do. That's awesome. And Stephanie, tell us tonight, you know, that our, I guess the title of our topic is developmental milestones. So talk to us, what is a developmental milestone? How would you define that? So a developmental milestone is, um, it's a set of functional skills um, that most kids do at a specific age. Um, so for example, most kids sit independently around six months old, but it is a range. Um, so, you know, if your kid isn't hitting at exactly that time, there's usually a two to three month window on either end um, to be what's considered normal. That's great. I saw a meme recently on social media 
uh, talking about, you know, how as, we as parents, we compare our children and we compare to other children. Uh, but it said something like, you know, all popcorn kernels are in the same bucket with the same oil and the same heat, but they pop at different times. And so it's like knowing that range, but like you said, people are advancing at different times. And in light of that, what about if your baby is born premature? Like, should you expect obviously some delays there? So if your baby is born prematurely, you have to acknowledge that they have two ages. They have their chronological age and the adjusted age. So chronological meaning from the day they were born to today, that's how old they are. And the adjusted age is their chronological age minus the weeks that they were premature. So you have to take into account that the baby was born before their time. Their brain hasn't fully developed. Um, their sensory system hasn't fully developed, their organs haven't fully developed, their tone. Um, so we do take that into account when we're assessing the child. And our goal as therapists is to help them reach their milestones because once they turn the age of two, they're no longer considered premature. And if they do, if they continue to present with um, delays, the doctor will diagnose a child as develop developmentally delayed. Um, so it's very important to start early intervention and also seeking early steps, the early steps program. Wow, that's great. I didn't know that fact about when they turn two, that they're not considered. They drop the diagnosis, yeah. Okay, yeah, early intervention, so key. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, what do we, how can we know if our child is developing on target, let's say? So um, you want to use those developmental milestones. There's a bunch of resources online. You can always Google developmental milestone for walking, and you'll probably find it, and you'll find tons. Um, and we want to be cautious because every child is an individual and there is a wide range, but we think of like for walking, some kids walk as early as nine months and then some as late as 14 months. So if your child starts walking anytime from nine to 14 months, that they're developing typically. Um, and then if they get to about the end of 14 months and they're not walking, that's when we would say, okay, we got to be concerned because they didn't reach this developmental milestone. Mm -hmm. um, and it's time to get a referral to see somebody or talk to your pediatrician about it. Yeah, that's so helpful. I have three children and my first child walked at 10 months and my third child walked at the very end of 14. And I thought, oh, but like you said, that range and everybody is growing and developing at their own pace. So that's great. Um, tell us who should we contact if we think that our child has a delay? Is there kind of like a first line of defense or first someone we should call? Yeah, so your, your first point of contact is going to be your pediatrician and basically they'll observe uh, your child and they'll ask you questions about how, how your child's doing and what your child's doing, kind of do a little screening um, and then they'll make the appropriate referral. So to come to PT or OT and speech, you need a prescription um, that the, the pediatrician will write for us and then we can schedule evaluations. I will also add, sometimes when the patient comes in for an OT eval, for, for instance, and I notice they may be delayed in some areas, I may refer to speech or to PT if I see, you know, the patient would benefit from PT, and then the, the parent will go and talk to the pediatrician and, and discuss their concerns. That's great. It's awesome to know how you're all working in tandem for the whole child, you know, you're like, okay, maybe that they need this area of expertise. That's so good. Uh, we talked a little bit about developmental milestones and how there's these ranges. I want to get a little more specific now. I'm going to give each of you a turn to talk, but I want to know, tell me, we'll start with Stephanie. Just talk to us about the developmental milestones for, um, you know, PT, and then let's do speech and language and OT kind of work our way through. So the biggest ones that most, you know, I, I get a lot are typically the ones in the first year of life um, up to walking about. So, you know, when the kid is, when the child is born, they need to be able to, when you put them on their belly, can they turn their head so that they can breathe? That's important. Um, and as the kid gets a little older, around one month, two months, they should be lifting their head really well when they're on their belly. Um, starting to lift their chest off the surface as well. Um, around three months, they should be, you know, going up on their forearms when they're on their belly, holding their head up really well. Um, when should my kids start rolling? Typically by five months, kids are rolling both from back to belly. Um, when should my kids start sitting? Usually by six months, kids are sitting independently, whether they're still propping with their hands or they're able to free their hands for play. All depends on your child. Um, Crawling usually uh, happens around eight months. Um, and then in that like nine, 10, 11 month age, you'll get pulling to stand, you'll get sidestepping along furniture, 
Um, and then really like, like Suzette said earlier, like nine, 10 to 14 months is when you see, you know, walking and like taking steps independently without holding on. And those are the biggest things that I get asked about usually. That's great. And that's when your house will never be clean again. <laughs> Once they start walking. <laughs> they get into everything. <laughs> and you'll get your exercise. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, Teresa, talk to us about OT milestones and then we'll hear from Suzette. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the first year of life since we're, right. I think we're all on the same page. Um, so usually uh, from birth, from birth um, to four to six months, uh, children have this palmer reflex. So if you place uh, your finger on the child's hand, they're gonna automatically close their hand. Um, around four to six months, um, that reflex integrates. So the children, um, I mean, in general, they should start having their hands a little bit more open and actively grasping for toys. Um, around four months, you'll see that children start exploring both hands, bringing both hands to the middle, um, bringing their hands to their mouth, bringing a toy to their mouth. Um, so you should see equal, both hands. If you see a child have um, an asymmetry where they're using one hand more than the other, that's a sign of concern. So I would definitely speak to your pediatrician in regards to that. Around um, five months, children start reaching um, bilaterally. So you may see them when they're, the parent is near that they may start lifting both hands up. Um, and you will also see them being able to like pull a string, a string of, to of a toy. Around five and a half to seven months is when you start um, seeing a child being able to transfer a toy from one hand to the other. They're gonna start banging a toy onto a surface. Um, during the first year of life, children are motivated to play um, by the physical, um, they're experiencing everything physically. They're seeing toys, they're um, feeling toys. Their brain is receiving all this information on how should I grasp a toy? How much does it weigh? How does it feel? How does it sound? So it's very important to give children um, different opportunities to develop those fine motor skills and sensory motor skills. Um, around five months, children start weight bearing through their forearms when they're in tummy time. And then at seven, they start extending their elbows. Now, it's very important that you know, children start tummy time. We're big advocates for tummy time because when you're weight bearing through those hands and arms, you're developing the arches of the hand too, which then will help you also manipulate items um, as you get older. Um, around nine months, children start developing uh, the pincer grasp. So you see them when they're grasping um, little Cheerios and they're feeding um, that they have the control of the, of the smaller muscles of the hands to be able to put it in their mouth. Um, then around 10 months, they start learning how to do like, we call it container play, where they start using toys in containers, taking them in and out. And this is when you see that they're learning how to release toys. Um, and then around 12 months, um, you see that kids, once they've learned to release, they're starting to stack maybe one to two blocks, I'm mean, not one, but stacking two blocks, they may start marking on paper. And so little by little, you continue with the goals, as, I mean, with the milestones as well. That's awesome. Just hearing you all, both of you share like the first year, just kind of, oh, it takes you back. You know, if you've had a child, you think, wow, they learn, their world is just expanding. They learn so much that first year. And it's um, amazing. Okay. Human grows. <laughs> Yeah, Suzette, talk to us about speech and language milestones that first year. So for speech and language milestones, I usually get the kids coming in um, and it's my kid can't talk. Um, and it's really the first words, but really things happen way before that for words to develop. So we're really looking for milestones such as reciprocal play. Like you use that sing song voice and they kind of sing back to you or make some noises back. Um, you give them objects and they start vocalizing. So you hand them a rattle and they're like, ooh, ah. Um, they start to imitate sounds, make raspberries, animal noises um, that join attention, that you have an object and they're looking back at you and you're sharing an interaction with a toy that you're holding. They start to initiate social games like peekaboo or chase, or they toss a ball back and forth. Um, they imitate movement. We start clapping and they clap back at us. Um, they point. They start pointing to objects before 12 months. They start gesturing, um, social referencing. They really want your attention. They want you to watch them do something. Um, that's when you put them in the playpen and they start screaming if you walk away and they're like, come watch what I'm doing. And they start pushing and pulling. And those are all things that happen before the first words. And I think that's what every parent really asks us all the time. How many words should my child have? And that's the biggest concern. Um, so words, usually 12 months, they should have one word. 
Um, but the average child will have about five plus words. Um, at 18 months, it's usually 10 words is the low average and the average is about 50 plus words. 24 months, we want them to have at least 50 words, but most kids will have 300 plus words and that's when they start combining words. And then at 36 months, um, we want them at least to have 250 words, but most kids have a thousand plus words and they're combining three words at a time. And when we think of words, words can be different things. It could be animal sounds like boff or sheep or exclamatory words like, uh oh, that's a word. Or mm -hmm. like mo for more, or they're using gestures or sign language to communicate. Um, you know, at 12 to 24 months, they're using a lot of nouns, person, place, things to describe. Um, 24 months to 30, they start saying animal names, body parts, using simple verbs like mommy, jump. Um, 30 to 36 months, they start using positional words. So in, on, out, color words. Um, and they start asking questions like, what's that? <laughs> um, and then we also look at early, early literacy from three to 12 months, they, they're able to like hold a book, chew a book. Um, 12 months to 24, they start opening those books, turning pages. 24 months to 36 months, they start to listen to books for longer periods of time. And then by three to four years, they start recognizing that print and books have meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also go into feeding and we'll ask questions about what they should be doing. But I know the next parental guidance is about breastfeeding to solid. So I was like, I'm not getting into that. And people yeah. can tune into that one. Yeah. Some of those milestones, which are also very important in development. Awesome. I love what you said too, about the early literacy. I feel like we could have a whole episode on that, about how important it is to read with your child, even when they're baby, you think, oh, they're baby. I don't know, but no, it's like so important. So I'm glad that you spoke to that. Um, Suzette, let's start with you. Now I want to ask each one of you, um, what happens when we take our child to be evaluated by a speech and language pathologist? So that's a great question. I know parents come in and they're nervous and they don't know what to expect. Um, so when they come into my office, I take a thorough case history. So I'm asking about birth history. I'm asking about their medical history. We're asking about developmental milestones and not only about speech ones, but I'll ask like, did your child walk when they were supposed to? Did they start crawling when they were supposed to? Do they like um, to sit in grass? And I'll ask things like that. So I know if I need to make a referral to occupational therapy or physical therapy. Um, and then we do complete standardized assessments when they're little, mostly it's parent questionnaires and we're asking the parent, you know, what's happening at home? What are they doing? Um, to compare them to age matched peers. And then we'll develop, um, if they do need intervention, we'll develop long-term and short-term goals um, with the parent to decide what we're going to do during treatment. That's great. Yes, it can be scary because you think, oh, you think, what's wrong? What's wrong with my child? You know, but I would say to any parent out there who's thinking, oh, like maybe I should pull the trigger. Maybe I should go get evaluated or assessed. I would say do it because getting help, um, especially that early intervention that you've all spoken about is so, so important. And even if you get there and you get a great report and everything is developing typically, that'll be so um, reassuring and affirming. And if not, you're going to get great help that you need. So I am an advocate for go get the assessment or the evaluation. Um, okay. So now in here, let's do, uh, Teresa, tell us what does an OT evaluation or assessment look like? So very similar to how Susie explained, the parent comes in with the child. Um, I'm obtaining a social history, medical history, what the child's routine is like, what toys they like to play, how do they interact with other kids at school, how do they, um, how much assistance do they need for their ADLs to put on a shirt, how are they manipulating items. In the meantime, as I'm um, interviewing the parent, I am watching the child, seeing if they're maintaining eye contact, if they're responding to their name, how are they transitioning um, during activity. Activities. During this time, I'm not intervening. If the child is running around the gym or throwing the toys, I am watching everything that they're doing because it gives me an idea of how they're performing at home. Um, as, an, as I'm listening to the concerns of the parent um, and uh, the reason for referral, I'll determine which standardized assessment to perform. 
And um, based on the standardized assessment, um, clinical observation, and the parents' goals, we come up with a plan if the child needs therapy. We come up with the frequency, well, I would recommend the frequency and duration. And um, after, let's say, six months, I will revisit those goals, see how much the child has progressed. And in the case that they don't, they no longer need therapy, I discharge. And in the case that they would continue to benefit and progress, we revise the goals and continue with therapy. Um, so yeah. Great. No, I love it. That's great. I love that you're interviewing the parent and watching the child. I experienced that in our evaluation. I thought, come on, do something, do what you do at home that I'm here for, you know? And he's just like, enough, you know, I, I see the, I see the parent always look at me kind of like, are you going to do anything? You see that my child is running around. I'm like, no, this is how they're doing now. I'm just watching, uh -huh. observing. Let's see next session. What I'm all in. taking it all in. Great. All right. Stephanie, talk to us about um, PT and what does it look like to have an evaluation? So PT starts in a similar manner, lots of uh, talking to the family, figuring out, you know, what the child is doing, what they're able to do when they started doing certain skills, um, what their family home environment is like. Um, and then, you know, we kind of jump in and kind of assess their strength and their sensation and their balance. And, and if they have any postural deviations or any joint malalignments and things like that, that could be contributing to some of their issues. Um, and then, you know, we also do st standard as assessments that help us figure out where your child is performing, um, at what age level they're performing gross motor wise, and then how it compares to other kids their age. Um, but basically, we want to know how they move, how they walk, how they do stairs, how they jump, can they throw a ball, catch a ball, stand on one foot, you know, depending on the age, uh, it can be a, a very wide range of things. That's great. That's great. So our, to our listeners, I want to remind you, if um, a specific question comes to mind, drop that in our Q&A and I'll do my best to get it in front of our experts. Um, I do have one question from our audience I'd love to put before you. And I think this one um, maybe is for Stephanie, but if it's, you know, I'm not the professional. So if all of you want to chime in, that's great. But um, this guest asked, how can we help a 13 and a half month old who walks, but only by pushing a walker? They want to help the baby, you know, learn to walk by themselves or to trust holding hands. Uh, do you have any advice for her? Um, yeah, so my advice would be to first look at how comfortable the child feels standing without holding on, you know, because a child is not ready to truly walk independently and take steps if they can't let go of a surface. So a lot of times um, giving them a walker and something to push can sometimes um, make them dependent on it. Um, so I'll encourage um, play at the fridge where they have magnets and they can't really hold, they can hold on or like clapping, um, you know, banging toys together um, in front of a toy where they're encouraged to let go of the support surface. Um, and then I'll start moving uh, the toys from one surface to another surface that's just out of arm's reach from them to try and encourage them to take a step or two from one surface to another. And as they start building that confidence, then they'll start feeling more comfortable taking steps on their own. That's so helpful. It's stuff that when you say it, I'm like, Duh, of course I should do that. But you just don't, you don't think to do those things. And so to have someone to speak and encourage you in these specific ways we can help our children is so helpful. So great. If any of our other guests have any questions, drop them there and I will um, put them in front of our, our experts. Let's talk about, we are living through a pandemic. Hopefully we're almost through, but what, I mean, we've been in it long enough to surely see some trends. Are there any developmental trends that you're seeing with children born during the pandemic? Is there anything that we're seeing? So I'll start off with a little bit. Um, I've noticed that a lot of kids are having trouble separating from their parent. So during the lockdown, they were only interacting with their parent. Um, so they come into my sessions and they are glued to, to mom and dad and are having trouble engaging in a toy because they lack the trust to engage with um, with adults. Mind you, at the age of two, it's completely normal to have um, parent separation anxiety, um, but little by little, they should start gaining a little bit of trust with familiar adults. I have little ones that I've been working with for over a year, and they're still glued to mom and dad, but they play with me while holding on to mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've also noticed that um, during the pandemic, I know it's been hard for parents um, that they had to work from home while also taking care of their kids. And especially with the little ones, I think that there's been an, an increase with screen time. 
So for instance, I'll be working with a little one. Um, and if I bring a toy, sometimes they're not as motivated to play with it. But the second a phone comes out of nowhere, all of a sudden they're crawling or they're trying to reach for the, the toy or they're attending. Um, which um, as an OT, I, I more uh, prefer a three-dimensional toy that they can manipulate, learn how to like um, play with. Um, I'm also seeing um, with masks, it's been really hard for babies to identify um, or, or interpret facial gestures um, from an early age. Children, you know, they look at a smile and they respond to a smile. They look at a frown, they're like, oh, something's wrong with them. Um, and not to say anything bad about masks, they've They've been protecting us during the pandemic, but I have noticed um, a decrease in social interaction skills because of the mask wearing. Um, then I have, I think I had one more. Um, oh, and decreased social skills. I've seen so many little ones. Um, when we started seeing outpatient kids during the pandemic, that they would look at another child and they would be like, what is that? Like if they, they have never seen a child before in their life. Um, and it's been very interesting because they don't know how to approach a child or how to interact or how to engage or, um, and little by little, you know, we were teaching them those skills. And, you know, as the pandemic has gotten better, um, parents are taking the kids more to the playground and kids are seeing other kids, but it, it, it was very interesting in the, during the pandemic. That is, that's really interesting. You don't think of how much it's just perhaps affected our children. So thanks for sharing. I don't know, Steph or Suzette, would you add anything in your realm? Yeah, so I definitely think that we've had decreased socialization for a lengthy period of time. And um, socialization and its social interaction is essential for language development. So I do see the speech therapy waiting lists have grown. We are getting tons of kids that are 18 months and they're not talking, but when you really, the parents come in and I start asking a little bit of case history, they haven't had a lot of social interaction. So they haven't been able to learn conversational skills, turn-taking, understanding facial expressions with masks. Um, so I, I do, I'm starting to get a lot of these that they appear developmentally delayed or they are developmentally delayed, but it's really lack of experience. Um, and we just have to encourage parents and give them some strategies to do at home in order for them to meet these developmental milestones. Yeah, that's great. And that's encouraging to hear in the sense of like, it's a delay, but like, it's a delay just because we need to expose them more to those opportunities. So you don't know that until you go and have that evaluation and um, get that, you know, professional help. So thanks for that. All right, Stephanie, what about in the world of PT? How has pandemic affected us? In, um, in the world of PT, one of the things I've kind of noticed is, um, you know, it's in a specific group of kids. We get these kiddos that are, are what's called a little bit low tone. So they're just a little bit weaker, a little bit floppy or than the normal baby or child. Um, and I've noticed that for those low tone kiddos um, that normally, you know, start daycare or, you know, have other siblings or interact with other kids and friends, family friends, um, they tend to, you know, keep up a little bit better than the kids I've seen now during the pandemic. I've gotten quite a few um, low tone kids that have just been really behind and it's because of lack of experience. They just haven't had the opportunity to move and learn the way that other kids have going to school, watching their siblings, watching other kids. Um, so they've just been a little bit more behind, um, but luckily they've all made good progress. So that's, Thanks. that's good. Awesome. Um, I want to sprinkle in a couple audience questions. One uh, for Suzette and Stephanie. One guest is asking, what are your recommendations for finding a PT and OT um, for children with special conditions? So this guest, her daughter has brittle bone disease and needs evaluation, but she's worried about finding a therapist who would specialize in that condition. Do you have any advice for her? That's an OT, OTPT question. Mm -hmm. PT. Oh, sorry, I said Suzette. <laughs> You're like, oh, what about that is speech? See, I'm not the expert, clearly. <laughs> yeah, Teresa and Seth. I mean, I think in general, um, we'll, as a therapist working in any facility, any, any place, we have to be aware of the precautions that each individual has when we're treating them. Um, aside from that, um, I, I don't know. Yeah, so so a kiddo with brittle bone disease, um, depending on on the the, the specific patient's um, physician's recommendations for for um, 
you know, restrictions. Maybe they don't want, the doctor doesn't want weight bearing after, uh, until a certain age or whatever. Um, that would be something that they would just want to share with their physical therapist. Um, from our standpoint, um, we see a lot of patients that come from the NICU at Jackson because we have a very large NICU there. Um, so a lot of our kids, um, have a history of, um, like brittle bone, um, disease or, or, um, rickets, which is a similar, um, diagnosis. So, so it just depends on if the physician has any special precautions that they want the therapist to follow, but any, any pediatric therapist should be able to treat that child. Um, now on a side note, um, hospital-based facilities, provide, I, I would say, therapy more to medically acute patients. So for instance, us at, um, Lynn, at Lynn Rehab, we see the transplant patients from MTI. We see patients from oncology um, who have received maybe a bone marrow transplant that need to be seen in a secluded area where there's no other kids. Um, we see the kids after, the, you know, they leave from the rehab that we have who have suffered from brain injuries or, um, um, polytrauma and things of that sort. So, you know, there are different settings for different um, individuals. Thank you. I think that's helpful. Um, thank you to our audience member too for asking a great question. Um, here's another one. How have therapies altered considering the new CDC milestone guidelines? So there's been talk lately about the new modifications to the CDC milestone guidelines. Um, how does that affect your work as therapists? So in the sense of speech, um, we are kind of working on the old milestones and the American Speech Hearing Association has contacted the CDC and they're working together to try to um, update those norms. Um, and it's not so much the CDC change for speech specifically, they just kind of lowered the standards. Um, and it's the only, what we're a little hesitant to is I don't, it, children should have a first word by 12 months. And we fear if they, the standard is a little bit lower, they're going to wait a little longer to get services. And early right. intervention is very vital. So we don't want these kids to start speech therapy when they're two years old, when we really can start at 15 months and get the ball rolling because the brain is more plastic and, and acquires more the younger their child is. Amazing. Amazing. Great. Thanks. One of the biggest ones for us is that they removed crawling from um, as a milestone, as a milestone and, and we both feel um, that that's extremely important. Um, like Teresa was mentioning earlier about developing the arches of the hands, but that also, you know, um, it causes, I mean, crawling helps them develop strength in their shoulders, which is important in their trunk, <laughs> in their trunk. It also um, helps them develop bilateral coordination and being able to move um, limbs in alternating patterns, uh, um, which then correlates to walking. Um, it also helps with weight shifting, which correlates to walking and sidestepping. So um, very controversial, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, I'm not an expert, but when that came out, I was like, crawling, what do you mean? We need crawling. That's so, I mean, the brain development that happens, like you said, with that bilateral movement. Um, yeah. So I'm going to let you guys take that up with the CDC, but <laughs> you're the experts. Um, okay. Here's a specific question. What are some techniques that can be used to increase vocabulary? And let's say specifically this guest is asking, they have a 14 month old, you know, they talk, they point out objects, they're singing songs. What are other things we can do for our little ones to help increase their vocabulary? So my number one thing I love to tell parents is narrate your day. So kind of like self-talk. Um, you're going to get in the car with the baby and you're going to be like, we're going to open the car and we're going to put you in your car seat and we're driving. Um, you go to the grocery store and you just say what you're doing. We're going to, we need the grocery list. Um, what are we going to get bananas? Should we get yellow banana or do we need the green bananas? Um, and really narrate what you're doing and you're giving them that vocabulary. Um, also repetitive books and songs are really good. Um, using verbal routines, like when you're, uh, tossing a ball ready set and you kind of stop and then the baby might say go or you model it a couple times ready set go and then give them that blank and they hopefully say it back so narrating and verbal routines are probably my biggest suggestion I tell parents 
That's great. I love the routines thing. I think about the narration, but the routines, that's like such a good thing to just teach them. So um, Suzette, while we're talking about this, and you mentioned a little bit about just the brain, the plasticity of the brain, but what specifically is early intervention and how can it help our children? So early intervention are services and supports that are available to children from zero to three who are at risk for developmental delays or disabilities. Um, early intervention really supports the family and the caregivers to increase the child's participation in daily activities and routines that are important for that family. Um, the services might include speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, or other types of therapies in a variety of settings. Um, and it really is a positive er early learning experiences are crucial um, for later success in the future. And that's why we wanna do early intervention. Here in the state of Florida, it's called Early Steps. So we do refer a lot of families to Early Steps um, and that's a great resource for parents. Awesome, Early Steps. So Google Early Steps, um, so, so, so important. And you said one to three, right? Or birth to three. Is, birth to three right. is really what we call that early intervention. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Again, we're going to do our round table. So I want to know my question for each of you is how can we play with our child to help them meet? We'll start again with you, Suzette, speech and language developmental milestones. How can we play with them to help them meet their milestones? So play is how a child learns. So I tell parents, get on the floor, sit with them, follow their lead. Um, I talked about verbal routines, self-talk, um, narrating what you're doing with the repetitive books, Using times of days like bath time, you can work on body parts. Okay, what are we gonna wash? Are we gonna wash your nose and let's wash your belly and where's your hair? Let's wash your hair. Um, so really play, um, take the time of not having too many demands on your child, but I'm just gonna sit with them and play, I'm gonna follow their lead and that's really gonna develop their speech and language. That's great. Awesome. I love what you said too, just about in that routine. We I've started to do with my 16 month old He's so wiggly when I change his diaper and it just makes it impossible. And so we've started to do, where's your head? Where's your belly? Where, you know, working on those things, but it also keeps him still. So multi-purpose. Um, all right, Stephanie, tell us about PT. What are things we can do to play? So for PT, honestly, in those, in the little ones, the biggest thing that you can do for them is just put them on the floor, put them on the floor, let them explore do lots of tummy time, you know, put toys down, move them away, spread them apart, encourage them to move and, and move around their environment um, and just give them lots of opportunity to, to move. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. All right, Teresa, OT, how can we play their babies? I would say it's very important for the parent to connect and engage with their child. You know, parents are their biggest motivators and their biggest fans, but they're also their favorite, I mean, they're their, the favorite toy of a child. So just look at your child, engage in peekaboo, social play, provide your child with experiences to touch different textures, hear your voice, hear different sounds, um, and also provide them with the proper toys so that they learn how to grasp and shake them and, and bang them together as well. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, okay, here's a little specific question for you, Suzette. Um, is there a benefit to teaching your child some sign language, you know, the, like, please more? Uh, would that help develop their language abilities? So it counts as a word um, and it, what, I, what it does is decrease frustration. So definitely I encourage parents to teach their kids gestures. Um, a lot of my sessions for the kids that don't talk, I usually start with gestures. So I'll teach them more or give me or open and I can decrease their frustration and then eventually start working on them actually verbally saying something. So I think definitely teach your kids gestures because they are words. They're a way for them to communicate and decrease frustration. That's great. My first baby was like, more please. You know, and my third baby's like, ah, give me food. And I'm like, I think maybe mama didn't spend as much time with number three on the side as we did with number one. <laughs> but you're right, eliminating the frustration is huge. Um, what about circling back to um, early steps and early intervention? What can parents be doing while they're waiting? Sometimes it can take months, you know, to kind of get in and get all that moving. What are things that um, parents can be doing in that interim? Definitely, I would say play with your kid, um, using those verbal routines, a self-talk, narrating, um, 
You can also seek through your insurance services. So if you don't get into early, you can start the early steps process and still see your pediatrician and have them refer you to whether it's speech, OT or PT that you need. Um, so those are some options. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, one question came in that how can we tell if our child has a developmental delay as a newborn? Um, are there things or signs that we would notice or kind of got to wait a little bit to see? What do you have advice there? Um, I guess kind of the first signs when they're they're newborn um, would be um, uh, a lot of alignment things like do they hold their head in the middle? Can they clear their airway when they're on their belly? Like do they turn their head so they can breathe? Um, do they keep their arms like out by the side and their legs floppy on the surface when you lay them on the bed? Or are they able to bring their hands close to their face? Um, you know, cause a lot of babies, um, have what we call like physiological flexion when they're born. So they like to keep their, their knees up tucked, kind of like in a little frog position. And they keep like to keep their arms in close to their chest and their face. Um, so some of the big red flags for kids, uh, when they're that little is if they, if they don't do that, if they hold themselves or if they're very stiff and you feel them very stiff, that's another red flag, um, can you guys think of anything else on your end? Yeah, I think those are the big things. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question on that note. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Suzette. No, I was um, just thinking of feeding and stuff like that. So maybe they're having trouble sucking, swallowing. They could see a speech language pathologist. Right. That's great. Um, this is just a question that popped into my head because I swaddled all my babies. Um, you know, you're talking about how they do this and they want, you know, always had Houdinis that got their hands out. But is it, do we do them a disservice to swaddle them with their arms down at, at newborn age? Like, should we swaddle them with their little hands close or is there um, technique to that? Yeah, it's better to swaddle them with their hands um, in the middle for sure, because that's yeah. how they like to be and that's how they'll learn quicker to play with their own hands and bring their hands to their mouth. And that's a soothing technique for them as well. Yeah. Great. That's great. Yep. Definitely swaddled all the babies like this. <laughs> so next one we'll do like this and <laughs> see how it goes. Um, wonderful. This is so helpful. Um, again, thank you to our audience for throwing in some great questions here too. Um, okay. Did we get to, um, did we get to you about how we play with our children? Yes, we did. Teresa, you shared with us, right? Okay. I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Um, okay. Now let's talk about how can sensory or behavioral issues impact development? Okay. So this is a, a big it's question. OT. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in regards to sensory, a lot of the babies that we get from the NICU, um, when they're born prematurely, um, they're exposed to this environment where they're having sounds, they're having uh, people poking at them, they're outside of the womb where they should be, you know, receiving that proprioception and that flexion. Um, once I see them, I see many, I see different reactions. I can either see them hyper responsive to stimuli. So if they hear a, vo uh, a sound that comes out of nowhere, sometimes they get easily startled. Or if I touch them, they don't want me to touch their hands. Or some of them can be um, very, I would say, once they start growing up, very clumsy and bumping into items and they don't have regards to like what's happening in their environment. So I think it's important um, as they grow to be able to monitor and identify um, how, are, how are they responding to their environment? Are they hypo-responsive or are they hyper-responsive? And once you identify um, how they are to different stimuli, um, being able to provide them with the proper environment for them to learn and play to help them grow. Um, so I teach them how to sensor, sensor, regulate their sensory um, experiences. Some of them may need a little bit more stimuli um, to wake up, and some of them may need to learn ways to uh, calm down and self-soothe um, to promote attention to activities. In regards to behavior, um, I have many parents that tell me, oh my goodness, my child is having tantrums. They're driving me nuts. I don't know how to calm them down. Um, I think you know tantrums are great. It's part of development. Um, children at the age of one learn um, to develop trust. A child cries, they're hungry, they, you know, they need their diaper changed, they're, um, they want to sleep. Mom and dad are there to take care of them and they develop trust. Um, once they're um, going from the age of two to three, 
they start developing independence. They want to take control of everything. Um, so it's, you know, this is a time when they're learning how to manage their frustrations. And if they don't know how to cope with their emotions and how to uh, start transitioning to different activities, it's going to affect them as an adult. And then that's when you're, you're going to see adults later on that have maybe issues managing their anger or their sadness because they never learned it as a child. So um, I got a lot of little ones that, you know, they're great with their fine motor skills. They know how to manipulate late items but they have full-on tantrums that keeping them from going on to the next level like if something's too hard they just give up or if something's too easy they don't want to attend to it we try to find the just right challenge but at the same time showing them how to manage their frustration and participate in an activity while they're able to attend to it a little bit longer that's great that is great. Um, this is the stuff I'm super interested in because my son, we're just, again, two weeks into OT, but we're seeing that he is sensory seeking in just certain contexts and in certain, um, I guess, tactile ways or, or whatnot. And uh, so it's very enlightening just to, to see all the resources available um, to help our, our sweet ones. And so thank you all for sharing tonight. I want to wrap up with one more question because um, maybe a parent is out there and they're listening, um, or maybe this, this gets forwarded on to a friend of a parent later, um, after the webinar is over, but maybe they're listening and they think, oh, maybe my child really needs to begin therapy services, or maybe we need to get this checked out. How do you begin the process and how long should you expect your child to need services? I know it would vary child to child and you've spoken how you would, you would speak about that, but coach us through, how do we just begin the process? So the first thing that we need is a prescription of referral from um, your child's pediatrician. Um, so we need a diagnosis and why they're coming to see us. Um, after that, we um, you provide the script to the pedi pediatric clinic that you're interested in going to um, and um, provide them with your insurance information and they will call you to schedule an evaluation. Once the child uh, gets evaluated and the therapist decides the frequency um, and the goals, um, they're followed for treatment. Um, the goals will be revised um, as the therapist decides, you know, maybe I'm going to write my goals for six months and then you know, they'll decide whether or not to continue with therapy or if it's time to discharge if they met, if they met their goals. We'll also, we'll also get some chronic kids that, you know, for example, like a cerebral palsy kid who, you know, they make progress early in life and then sometimes their progress slows down. So, you know, as they get a little older, your, your treatment, um, your treatments will be, um, short-lived, you know, you'll see them for six months, you'll re-educate family on, on home exercise programs and help order new equipment for a patient. Maybe they need a new wheelchair, maybe they need new braces for their feet or whatever it is that they need. Um, and then, and then there can be a discharge. Um, I like to, to say for like the little ones that we get out of the NICU, those premature babies, um, we really do what we can to try to catch them up to their chronic chronological age. So that's kind of where we look to a discharge. So if you have a preemie baby at home and you want to know, well, am I going to be at this forever? Because they're always going to be behind. The answer is no. Um, you know, the hope is to catch up as quickly as we can and, and look to discharge as a rule of thumb. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. And Suzette? So for speech, definitely a referral from a physician, or we also are trained to diagnose. So you can hire a speech language pathologist um, privately or in some clinics, you don't need a referral from anyone. You can say, I have a concern and we can evaluate and diagnose your child. Great. Wow. I didn't realize that. Okay. That's awesome to know. Um, this is so enlightening. And I just think that you guys have just such a fun job. I mean, it's a hard job, I'm sure, no <laughs> doubt, but I think so fun. I know my son was most surprised by how many awesome toys the OT had. And I think, man, we could do a whole episode on, and, and someone recommended too, like, can we do an episode on games to play with our children to enhance their brain and language and I'm like, that sounds like an awesome episode and get you back. Send us all your favorite toy and game recommendations for helping our little ones develop. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I want to put up a slide here to show you some resources. So um, those of you who are watching in, if you want to screenshot this or grab your, your phone and take a picture, but these are some 
great resources if you have concerns or you just want to do a little more research on your own. So um, solidstarts.com, asha.org, pathways.org, and then there's the link to early steps. And of course, this episode, give us about a week um, to get it all edited and up on the website, but jacksonevents.org. There are literally almost 40 episodes, everything from mental health and COVID and autism and um, a host of topics in between. They're available to you. So you can go back and watch those resources, forward it to a friend. Um, Just thank you so much, Teresa, Stephanie, Suzette. So glad to join you tonight. Um, And again, thank you so much to You Health Jackson Children's Care for putting this on.